If you want to live free, this video is about how people have done it. Last time I talked about how states and governments think, and how they decide, the logic of ruling others, and the logic of escaping state rule. In this video, we're considering the history of a part of the world that illustrates these rationales. As we'll see, this history, which most people know nothing about, is still pretty relevant today. By the end, you'll be able to think like a pre-modern state and like a person escaping the state. Today, we're stepping into their shoes. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the show for the angry old man in all of us. This week's video is sponsored by Box of Stuff. Who doesn't want a box of stuff delivered to their place? Who knows what kind of stuff will be in the box? God knows we all need more boxes. Box of Stuff. The box that's full of something. I'm going to be drawing from this book, The Art of Not Being Governed, by James C. Scott. The book posits that Zomia, an academic term for the upland regions of South Asia, has been a site of various strategies for avoiding being ruled by lowland states. I should probably mention that Scott's work has been challenged by other scholars, and I don't know. So it might be better to think of it as theory based on what has happened in many parts of the world, what methods people have found to live free and avoid the rule of the state, rather than a completely accurate history of the place and time. Imagine you were king. Not today, but a couple thousand years ago. What are your priorities? You want to build up your kingdom, so at least your rule is stable. You might feel the need to conquer more people and control more land just to be strong enough to defend your rule from outside forces. Outfitting an army requires resources like iron, but especially food. So who grows the food? Until your kingdom came along, the people in this area were mobile and ate the things they knew the land and water provided in the appropriate seasons. But mobile, independent people don't want to work for you. What would their incentive be? But you need to perpetuate your rule, so you enslave them. You capture them, stop them moving around, give them fields to cultivate, and tell them their job for the rest of eternity is to work for you. You might even build walls to keep them in. The Great Walls and the anti-Miao Walls of Hunan were seen officially as a barrier to barbarians, whereas, in fact, they were built just as surely to hold a tax-paying, sedentary, cultivating population within the ambit of state power. Now you have people to produce for you, you want to work out a tax system. As I explain in this video, taxes help determine the nature of the social system imposed on us. You order your people to conduct geographic and demographic surveys, collect census data, and draw clear boundaries to make things simple and possible for a bureaucracy to manage. Burmese King Talun in the early 17th century made an effort to list the land under cultivation and thus taxable. The people's names, ages, sex, birthdays, and children, the members and lands of the various crown service groups, the local officials in their service lands, and the boundaries of their jurisdiction. The king wanted, in effect, a complete inventory of his taxable resources. You might even prohibit various activities, like moving, that made your records invalid. You commission the drawing of maps with lines declaring what part of the world is your property. Not everyone within those lines works for you yet, but you plan to conquer and assimilate them all eventually. You and your soldiers begin to feel some twinge of guilt for enslaving people, forcing them to settle in close proximity, and making them farm rice for the rest of their lives. So you come up with reasons why it's right. You're so fortunate to be here, you tell your subjects. Living like this in the state core is the pinnacle of civilization. We define civilization, so whatever we do is civilized. But you need an insulting term for those just out of your reach to show how obviously superior life is under your rule. Those people are barbarians. They're just running around killing each other now. We'll be doing them a favor by enslaving them. They'll get education, culture, the chance to be conscripted into the majesty that is your fleeting little autocracy. These justifications become your identity, your reality, the contrast between life in your glorious kingdom and life among the smelly barbarians. The permanent settlement of populations is, along with taxes, perhaps the oldest state activity. 
It's always been accompanied by a civilizational discourse in which those who are settled are presumed to have raised their cultural and moral level. While the rhetoric of high imperialism could speak unselfconsciously of civilizing and Christianizing the nomadic heathen, such terms strike the modern ear as outdated and provincial, or as euphemisms for all manner of brutalities. And yet, if one substitutes the nouns development, progress, and modernization, it's apparent that the project under a new flag is very much alive and well. Over time, as you indoctrinate multiple generations and make them think the way you want, you get the opportunity to shape society to your liking. Monoculture, like rice or wheat, fosters uniformity at many different levels. Your subjects cultivate the same things, so they follow the same rhythm of seasons, so they lead similar lives. They come to have patriarchal families like yours. The uniformity in the field produced a social and cultural uniformity expressed in family structure, the value of child labor and fertility, diet, building styles, agricultural ritual, and market exchange. A society shaped powerfully by monoculture was easier to monitor, assess, and tax than one shaped by agricultural diversity. In times of surplus, you attempt to expand your kingdom, which is accomplished by conquest, but some people are harder to subdue than others. Many of the barbarians are fiercely independent, but might still have chiefs you can corrupt and turn into your puppet, or kill and replace. Others might have no leaders, which makes your task more complicated. The British in Burma, for example, preferred autocratic tribal regimes in compact geographical concentrations with which they could negotiate. Conversely, they had a distaste for anarchic, egalitarian peoples who had no discernible spokesman. You would have to use a lot of force to transfer these people to your rice planting core. And you might even calculate trying to enslave or tax this handful of scattered people wouldn't be worth it. Or maybe your soldiers just can't find them. You've expanded your rule as far as it can go across flat ground because it's easy to move your army around. If you had a maritime empire, you could spread it even farther because water makes transportation even easier. Think of the British Empire, Venice, or the Vikings. But until about a century ago, it was much harder to conquer people living in hills or swamps, and those lands and the people on them remained outside the control of the state. If there is a stalemate with the barbarians or competition with another state for their favor, you could offer the barbarians inducements to join the ranks of your rice farmers, like their own little place to live and cultivate, maybe offering to exempt them from conscription and taxes for some time. From time to time, like real estate agents in a buyer's market with a high vacancy rate, competing states would offer favorable terms to those who would agree to settle under their wing. Thus, northern Thai leaders offered the Lawa and Karen exemption from corvée, forced labor, and taxes as long as they would permanently settle in a designated area and provide annual tribute and valuable mountain products. In the teeth of rapacious district officials, military commanders, and slave raiders, however, even the well-intentioned ruler was unlikely to be able to keep such a promise. If you think you can get away with it, you might alter the deal. They're just barbarians, after all. But what if you wanted to be a barbarian? Let's put ourselves in the place of the workers, the peasants, farmers, slaves, and corvée laborers whose toil enables their own oppression. You don't like your life that much, just working all day in the fields and getting plundered by soldiers and bandits. You're worried your kids will get conscripted into the army, or that they'll die in the epidemic that could only have been epidemic thanks to people being forced to concentrate in close proximity with animals and each other. But what if, just over the hill, just on the other side of the woods, the sovereignty of the state ended? What if the state couldn't enslave you from over there? Would you go for it? The existence of an open frontier operated like an automatic break on what the state could extract. Motivated by factors as disparate as epidemics, famines, taxes, corvée labor, conscription, factional conflict, religious schism, shame, scandal, and the desire to change one's luck, it was relatively simple for households and entire villages to move. By moving, people were both securing their freedom and denying the state its most valuable resource. What the valley polities needed most from the hills were people. Those it could not attract by the advantages of trade and cultural opportunities it tried to seize through slaving expeditions and wars. Thus, of all the commodities that the hill societies could deny the valleys, their trump card was manpower. 
It was the flight of hard-pressed valley subjects from the state corps and the migration of hill peoples beyond the range of easy capture that was the Achilles' heel of valley states. The kings and generals in the lowland states say you just don't know how great it is down there, working all day and doing whatever some guy with a sword says. But what if you do know and you're consciously trying to avoid it? How would you do that? First, where could you go? Are there mountains around you? Jungle? This book focuses on the hill people of Zomia, but other inhospitable terrain has provided refuge in other parts of the world. The wetlands of the Everglades provided refuge for Seminoles who were able to resist the United States for decades. Like the Seminoles, you want to prepare to be invaded and raided by states, bandits, and slaving expeditions. How do you avoid them? How do you defend yourself? You use the terrain. From the perspective of those retreating to the hills, it was a natural advantage they could exploit. They could, as the Igorot did in the Philippines, cut off the mountain passes and, when necessary, retreat deeper and deeper into the hills. The mountains favored defensive warfare in general and provided innumerable places where a small group could hold off a much larger force. Nowadays, of course, armed with helicopters, drones, satellites, etc., mountains and other terrain are more accessible to an invading force, so more creative use would need to be made of them. Still, the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, has holed up in the mountains in the southeast of Turkey for like 40 years now. And that's just mountains. Coasts, wetlands, jungles, and rivers have all provided natural obstacles that helped fugitive people hold out. How would you organize your society? Big question, right? And it's just a thought experiment, since a society isn't really designed from the top down in one sitting, but emerges every day as its members create it. But what are some practices you might adopt if you were attempting not only to avoid lowland states, but to maximize your society's autonomy? You'd be keen to avoid any kind of coercive power, either imposed from the outside or growing from within. You can organize agriculture to avoid the state, as we'll see, and you can structure decision-making to avoid the state, too. Every political system is a choice. Hierarchical political systems are the choice of the people at the top of them, whereas horizontally organized systems are the result of consensus among the people involved. As you might have learned from the dawn of everything, social institutions not designed by those at the top show considerable variation, depending on environment, seasonal food supplies, external pressure, or internal developments. Scott also gives a number of examples of egalitarian social structures. They tend to emphasize equal access to both resources, so not letting anyone hoard, and decision-making power, not letting anyone emerge as the leader of everything. If Scott and his sources are correct, and if Pierre Clast was correct, these modes of governance are consciously chosen to evade the state. How would you create an identity for yourself? Identity can vary with where you are and how you want to position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the state. The state calls you barbarians and you might proudly choose to take up that title. You tell stories to reinforce your values, like how your people are free and equal, while contrasting your society with that of your enemies, where they're unfree and unequal. You might have an oral history telling of the horrors of being a slave, or the time your people killed one of their own for trying to become a tyrant. State rulers find it well-nigh impossible to install an effective sovereignty over people who are constantly in motion, who have no permanent pattern of organization, no permanent address, whose leadership is ephemeral, whose subsistence patterns are pliable and fugitive, who have few permanent allegiances, and who are liable over time to shift their linguistic practices and their ethnic identity. There's one more thing we need to think about, though. A big thing. Maybe the biggest. What's for dinner? Back in the state core, like most people, your job was to farm rice. But what if there was a blight and the one crop you depended on failed? There would be massive famine. Now imagine that instead of being forced to plant rice, you could go into the hills and forage. Foraging provides a much more varied diet. And if one plant or animal you relied on spoiled, you could go find a substitute. You could grow crops and remain pretty mobile. In Zomia, people would clear very small plots to grow maize, cassava, sweet potatoes, and a few cardamom bushes. The pattern was open to many small, scattered, unobtrusive plots. The same principles of dispersal and invisibility governing the behavior of human refugees also governed their agricultural choices. 
Where possible, they chose crops needing little care, crops that matured quickly, root crops that could not easily be destroyed or confiscated and which could be harvested at leisure. Roots and tubers such as yams, sweet potatoes, potatoes, and cassava manioc yucca are nearly appropriation proof. After they ripen, they can be safely left in the ground for up to two years and dug up piecemeal as needed. There's thus no granary to plunder. If the army or the taxmen want your potatoes, for example, they have to dig them up one by one. You could also try swiddening or slash and burn agriculture. Until recently, it was more efficient than monocropping and provided greater variety. And when combined with foraging and hunting for goods highly valued in the lowlands and in international commerce, it could provide high returns for relatively little effort. One could combine social autonomy with the advantages of commercial exchange. Going to the hills or remaining in the hills if you were already there was not, in most circumstances, a choice of freedom at the cost of material deprivation. I don't want to romanticize the life or exoticize the people depicted in this book. They're just people doing what they think is right. What it reveals is a history most people never learn about. People treated in official accounts as barbarians of no historical interest. A life of relative freedom in a world that seems determined to destroy it. There are places, groups, societies living beyond the reach of the state that claims them. But this list is incomplete. You can help by expanding it.